Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. A string of home invasion burglaries ends with the arrest of a man police say used every trick in the book to elude capture. A local high school hockey team finds a way to save their season after being told they couldn't keep playing because of an opposing player's positive COVID test. If you're one of many people hoping to get a vaccine at Ford Field, Michigan's Attorney General has a scam warning you need to hear. And we'll start there tonight at 6. As things got underway at today's Ford Field soft opening, the AG's office was putting out a warning. It involves high-tech thieves targeting people who live and work in Detroit. Our consumer investigator Hank Winchester joins us. And Hank, they're after people's personal information, which many people might think is just part of the process of getting vaccinated. Exactly, Kimberly. That's part of the problem. You know, the AG and her team, they've been out on front of this uh, from the beginning of the pandemic, warning us about problems and scammers that are trying to get your personal information and your attention. Well, now these scammers making their move as they know thousands of people are working to get an appointment at Ford Field. Thousands of you will soon be making your way into Ford Field to get vaccinated, and we know many are still working to get appointments, and the scammers know it. Investigators tracking a series of disturbing emails and text messages from high-tech thieves claiming to represent city, state officials, and Ford Field. All they're trying to do is get your personal information. Do not fall for it. You need to make sure that you're ignoring any immediate calls for action because they are um, hoping that that uh, high pressure tactic is going to get you to bite. Within the last week, investigators noticing a disturbing trend. Scammers reaching out to those who live in the city requesting personal information to get the vaccine. And now they are connecting to those who work in the city who are also eligible. The bottom line is do not fall for these scams. Make sure that you're being very cautious anytime you're receiving a text message or an email as well, that you don't click on any of the links within those messages. Michigan's attorney general releasing this statement. Scammers remain focused on taking advantage of the ongoing pandemic to gain access to your personal information. I cannot reiterate this enough. Do not fall for these attempts. State and local health departments will never call you with threats or unrealistic demands that include you having to hand over information like your social security number, birth date or address. And we have the full statement and warning from the attorney general on the Help Me Hank page at clickondetroit.com. Right now, investigators say the main way these high-tech thieves are trying to get your attention is by sending you a text message, either asking you if you'd like an appointment or asking you for personal information to confirm an appointment. It does not work that way. We're live here tonight. Hank Winchester, Help Me Hank. All right, Hank, now more than 2,000 people getting their COVID-19 vaccines at Ford Field today. And as we mentioned, what was sort of a soft launch at the stadium before a larger number of people are invited for the official opening of the vaccine site. At full capacity, the federally selected regional mass vaccination site will administer about 5,000 doses a day for two months. An additional 1,000 shots will be administered daily across Metro Detroit and not inside Ford Field. We've posted all the information you need to make an appointment on our website. Just go to click on Detroit.com. Let's move now to the latest coronavirus numbers and the cases keep rising, Kim. They do. The state reports 3,579 new cases and 16 additional deaths. Vaccinations continue to steadily go up with the state now saying 29% of Michigan residents have been vaccinated. Been a very challenging year for high school athletes, of course. First, there was uncertainty there would even be a season. Now, a lot of teams are finding their seasons cut short over exposure to the virus in some shape or form. Jamie Edmonds has the story about the Novi hockey team that fought to keep their season going. Jamie? The Novi hockey team's quarterfinal game is a go here tonight in Dearborn. But just this weekend, their whole season was in jeopardy. Novi Hockey played Livonia Stevenson Saturday in the regional final. A game that ended in an overtime win for the Wildcats. Last year we played Stevenson in the regional finals and it went into triple overtime and we lost. Playing Stevenson again and beating them in overtime this year. It was one of the most exciting 
uh, moments in my career. The Wildcats were riding high until Novi's athletic director got a call from a team they played on Thursday in the regional semifinal. Uh, there was a potential where we uh, could be going into quarantine. A positive case on an opposing team meant the Wildcats would have to quarantine and the season would be over. But how much exposure did the Wildcats have with that player? We went to the tape, the film, to kind of figure out exactly where we were um, and the amount of contact that we had. Less than 10 minutes per the video evidence. So Novi superintendent called the Oakland County Health Department. The decision was reversed pending negative COVID tests from all Novi players. Now the quarterfinal game with Trenton is back on. It was a big year for us because we knew that we had a lot of returning players. So we, we think that we can get far and hopefully win states. This roller coaster of a year continues. In this case, there was a positive ending for these kids. A high school hockey game will never be put in front of that, our kids' safety or anybody else's safety. Uh, it's just not that important in the grand scheme of life. Um, but for our kids at, at this at this moment in time, um, we're, we're fortunate and lucky that we're able to continue to compete. Jamie Edmonds, Local 4. That's all right. Okay, Jamie, thank you. Well, our weather is about to get more interesting, shall we say? <laughs> Not in the best way either. That's putting it kindly. <laughs> well, uh, ben is watching a couple of systems bringing uh, both rain and high winds our way too, Ben. Yeah, March was supposed to come in like a lion, but that got delayed about half a month, and now we're starting to see it. You probably felt those winds pick up a little bit today. They're still gusting at about 20 to 25, but as we get into tomorrow, about this time, maybe a little bit earlier, we'll see 30 to 35 mile an hour gusts. Rain's not going to be here until overnight. We'll pick it up at about midnight, and you can see it's widely scattered stuff through the morning commute. So more dry spots than wet, but the showers will be out there till about 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Then it all wraps up. Mild night tonight, but things get colder as we head towards the end of the seven day forecast, and it gets a whole lot wetter too. We need the rain. And we're going to get a ton of it as we get into Thursday and Friday. So we'll talk about that coming up. Local Forecasters app has your entire 10 day forecast where you can get a sneak peek at that precipitation. It is free in your app store as always by searching WDIV guys. Hey Ben, a Colorado community grieving tonight after yesterday's shooting at a Colorado grocery store. 21 year old Ahmad Alyssa faces 10 counts of first degree murder. Investigators say open fire inside the store, taking the lives of 10 people ages 20 to 65. Boulder police not only investigating the murders, but grieving the loss of one of their own. 51 year old officer Eric Talley. He was the first officer on the scene. Meanwhile, survivors are dealing with the shock and disbelief of the attack. It's definitely been rough. I mean, waking up this morning, processing everything, it's definitely been hard. Um, it's it's harder than it was yesterday just thinking about the friends that I lost. Investigators say they aren't clear about a possible motive in the attack. Here at home, Governor Gretchen Whitmer has ordered flags to fly at half staff to remember the victims of the shooting. For more on the investigation in Colorado, join Lester Holt for NBC Nightly News tonight, immediately following this newscast at 630. Troy police had a busy weekend, arrested an ambitious and elusive burglar. The Sterling Heights man charged with committing several home invasions. Rod Maloney live tonight at the Troy Police Department. And Rod, they believe this guy took upwards of $150,000 in cash and jewelry. That's right. Actually, it was more than that. And here's the thing. This is the kind of stuff you might see in a movie or a TV show. Because what they're telling us is that this guy allegedly burgled four homes in less than a week. He showed stamina and stealth, the likes of which they've not seen in a very long time overnight Saturday night. This is 40 year old Demario Darrell Thornton, arraigned this afternoon and held on $45,000 bond. Troy Police Lieutenant Joshua Jones told Local 4 officers first suspected Thornton after the first home invasion a week ago in the neighborhood near Somerset Collection. We had some video, different um, surveillance videos around the area and, you know, ring cameras and, and commercial businesses and stuff like that. Immediately, detectives went to work and followed Thornton to this Troy neighborhood at Livernois and Big Beaver Saturday night late. They say he went to work robbing two homes. Yeah, you know, I give our guys a lot of credit for uh, being able to do that. This was over the weekend that this occurred. So they came in, they were off duty. They um, got alerted that he was he was likely going to um, start 
working, work, looking for a residence to break into. They came in and got on him pretty quickly. Officers attempted to arrest him before he got to his vehicle, but Jones says Thornton threw his loot in the air and ran and kept running for miles and hours until he got desperate looking for a way out and started checking doors and homes near Waddles and I-75. So he found an open door on a residence up in the Waddles I-75 area in a um, subdivision there, went in and used their phone to call for a ride. Jones says Thornton got into and out of a home with a landline undetected. And when his ride showed up in the neighborhood, that's when police nabbed him. So it's this is quite the story. Now, one of the things they also say is that he is a has a prior record. And so that's part of the reason why they he became so elusive. But they also say they're still trying to figure out how it is that he was able to find four homes or actually three homes unoccupied in the middle of a pandemic and then to be able to get that much in the way of cash and jewelry back to you. And Rod, to reiterate, he went undetected in an occupied home and used the phone. Well, he, he used the phone, Devin, and then he stole stuff out of the house before he left to get his ride. Oh, man. And so they did nab him right as he came up, he said. <laughs> it's a new one. All right, Rod. All right, the head here at 6, an important Detroit community organization, prepares to say goodbye to the only leader it's ever had. And here's Dr. Frank George, Doc. What's the risk of getting COVID after being fully vaccinated? I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Coming up, a mom who got sick in spite of having the vaccine shares her story and why she's still 100% behind the shots.